Well, today, I don't know if you know this, uh, probably a lot of our younger people in the room would know this, uh, we are at the halfway point through this summer. It's kind of hard to believe that we're already there. Uh, my kids are definitely lamenting the fact that uh, their summer break from school is, is already half over. Uh, and it has been a crazy first half of this summer uh, in our world. Um, just four weeks ago, as uh, summer was getting started, uh, there was the terror attack on the nightclub in Orlando. And just this last week, of course, we had a pair of highly publicized and very controversial officer-involved shootings, and then the worst day in American law enforcement history since 9-11 with the murder of five Dallas police officers. There's been all sorts of other chaos in between as well. We have Britain uh, deciding to leave the EU. We've got uh, some American presidential candidates avoiding responsibility for some pretty serious misdeeds of their own. It's been a crazy summer, and we are only halfway done. Within the next couple of weeks, uh, our two major political parties uh, will have their national conventions. Those are almost certain to be hotbeds of discord and protest and all sorts of negativity themselves. We still have ISIS running rampant across the Middle East, and just about everywhere you look, um, there's some sort of crisis or chaos in the world. And people suggest all kinds of remedies for what can be done about that. Um, to deal with these problems that we're facing. And a lot of people, their, their ideas come down to laws. You know, we need to, we need to change our immigration laws, or we need to change gun laws, or we need to change election laws, and on and on it goes with the ideas of all the different new and uh, better and improved laws that we need. But I'm afraid that none of those recommendations is gonna touch the real problem that we see on our TV screens every evening with the news broadcast. That's because the real problem behind just about every catastrophe and crisis that our world faces is a spiritual problem. Right. We're seeing what happens in a world where people turn their backs on God, right. decide to go their own way and do their own thing. And that can be summed up in one little word that's considered pretty old fashioned these days. And that word is sin. All too often, these, we look at these deep and serious problems that we have in our country and in the world, and, and we think, well, we can fix this. All we need is some new laws, and that'll take care of it. Well, there are a couple of problems with that line of thinking, at least. First of all, laws aren't even designed to restore relationships between people. Um, they're just uh, to lay out the punishments for when people get out of line. And even if laws could bring people together, um, we've demonstrated uh, time and time again uh, that humanity is very adept at breaking the laws, no matter how good they are in the first place. What people really need is a change of heart. Amen. And the only real solution for the heart sickness that is carried by the world is a man named Jesus. Amen. Every person on earth needs to have radical heart surgery, to have their old sin-infected heart removed and replaced by the grace of God with a brand new heart. And the Bible calls that transformation becoming a new creation. And Paul is going to address this idea of new creation in Galatians chapter 6 that we are going to look at together today. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open up to the New Testament book of Galatians. And we're going to be in chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, that's okay. Uh, the verses will be on the, the screen up here behind me that we're going to be covering. And several of them are printed in the, the insert, uh, the sermon notes that's uh, inside your bulletin this morning. So if you want to go ahead and pull that out uh, as well, this would be a good time to get that. And uh, take some notes on what God uh, might be saying to you this morning um, through his word. Uh, and also, if you haven't done it yet, uh, if you jot some info on that little white envelope, that would be a terrific gift for us at the end of the service today. Uh, the last week, six weeks, we've been looking at this letter that Paul wrote uh, to the churches in the region of Galatia, in what today would be uh, modern-day central Turkey. And we've been seeing Paul lay out a masterful argument over these first five chapters for, law, for why laws will not fix our heart problem. Paul reminds these Christian believers in the region of Galatia that their salvation, their right standing with God, uh, came by placing their faith in Jesus and not by obeying laws. Amen. And so for five chapters, Paul has drawn a distinction between law and grace, between following the flesh or God's spirit, between slavery and freedom. And in just these last two chapters, Paul lays out the implications of a life that's lived in the freedom of the spirit. What a difference it makes when we rely 
on Jesus and his spirit, when we invite him to do his work inside of us rather than uh, relying on doing outward things to try and make ourselves right with God and with others. In chapter 5, we looked at last week, Paul paints a stark contrast between a life lived pursuing the desires of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. We're somewhat familiar with uh, that passage. And Paul wraps up chapter 5 with this statement in verse 25. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And Jason reminded us uh, masterfully last Sunday that while it is God that works in the hearts uh, and lives of those of us uh, who have submitted our lives to him to produce his good fruit in us, that we have the opportunity to either cooperate with him or fight him in that process. And things go much more smoothly and change comes more rapidly when we cooperate with the work of God's Spirit going on inside of us. Whenever I hear this phrase that Paul uses, let us keep in step with the Spirit, I always picture in my mind a three-legged race. Has anybody ever done one of those before? Just raise your hand. A few of us have, okay. It's been a long time since I've done one, but they're kind of fun. You, you know how it works. If you haven't done it, you've probably seen one done. Uh, you stand next to somebody, and you either have your, your left leg tied to their right leg or vice versa, or you put both your legs into a, uh, uh, some kind of a burlap sack so they're bound together, and then you attempt to walk together, and you race other people who are, are similarly tied together with three legs. And it's funny to watch. Uh, because people who, who don't think it through uh, and just kind of take off, they can't get their steps quite lined up and, and hilarious chaos ensues. It's a great thing to get video of if you ever see somebody about to do that. So whip out your phone. And, uh, for those who are able, though, to get started out on the right step and to keep in step with each other, it is an amazing fluid motion, and they progress quickly across the race course. Here's the awesome thing for those of us who have accepted the free gift of God's grace that he gives us in Jesus. When we keep in step with the Spirit, it's the same Spirit of Jesus that's at work in each of us so that we are also able to keep in step with each other. And that is when we experience the kind of unity that God wants for his people, his body, the church. And so the church's mission is the same mission that Jesus has, and that's to share the good news of God's grace with the world because only God's amazing grace, you may have heard, can save a wretch like me and like you and like everyone else. Only God's amazing grace can lead us as individuals and a society out of a place of lostness and blindness. So Paul goes on here in Galatians 6 to then describe what this community of grace that God is building uh, will look like when we all keep in step with his spirit. And a true community of grace can really change the world. And so I want to spend just a few minutes looking at how to live as a community of grace. As each of us keep in step with the Spirit, what does that look like when we're in step with each other at the same time? Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. So here's number one in your notes, if you're doing the fill in the blanks. Uh, in order to, to be a, communi- a community of grace, we need to be a community that restores people gently. I think we're doing a pretty good job of that here in the orchard. Um, many of us have uh, pasts that, uh, that we're not super proud of, and uh, our goal here is to share God's grace with one another and do that in a gentle fashion. But if we want to keep in step with the Spirit, if we want to keep in step with the Spirit, putting the emphasis there, uh, then we need to keep this value in front of us. Now, this verse does not say every time somebody sins, be sure to point it out to them, okay? That's not what it says, okay? We don't need to do the Holy Spirit's job for him, okay? We're all keeping in step with the Spirit. What this verse says is that if someone is caught in a sin, we should seek to restore them. And this isn't an, aha, I caught you kind of caught either. You know, that violates the whole, the whole concept of doing it gently as well. Paul's saying if you see someone whose life is getting all tangled up in some sin, which by definition gets us out of step with God's spirit and with each other, then you need to go and try and help them out of that mess. Uh, but there's also a caution here. It says we shouldn't make sure, should make sure that we don't get tangled up in that same mess ourselves. Paul says, watch yourself or you may also be tempted. 
several years ago, uh, a friend and I were asked by a young woman who attended our church if uh, we would come to her home and help her to kind of get her life untangled from some stuff that she was tangled up in and didn't want to be anymore. We didn't exactly know what to expect, um, but we wanted to help restore uh, our sister in Christ, as this, as this verse calls us to, and so we set an appointment, and, and we went over and met with her at her home. And when we got there, we encountered quite a mess uh, that needed uh, disposed of. This young woman was broken, and she was desperate. She had fallen back into some of the old habits uh, of her flesh, that had lingered around, and she wanted to break free of those, and she wanted our prayers, and she wanted our practical assistance, and she had already sort of started to assemble what she wanted to, to get rid of, and what was piled in the middle of the living room on a table and also uh, on the floor were boxes full of hard liquor and illegal drugs and pipes and syringes and pornographic magazines and videos. It was almost as if hell had thrown up a little bit right there in the middle of her living room. Now, uh, my friend had in his earlier days uh, been a bit of a partier himself and occasionally still struggled with alcohol. And that was one of the times in my life where I was having a particularly difficult struggle with the issue of pornography. So there we sat with a sister in Christ who needed our help, faced with the things that each of us had struggled with ourselves. So we decided to divide and conquer. And so I took the drugs and the alcohol and went down the hallway and, and poured it all down the toilet and flushed it. And then I took the, bo the, the box of empty bottles um, and paraphernalia out to my car to take to a dumpster somewhere. Then we got a couple of black trash bags and filled them up with all the, the pornographic materials. And I told my friend he needed to take that bag and, and get rid of it somewhere far away because I knew it would be too big of a temptation for me to deal with. And so after we prayed with this young woman, he took the bags and we went our separate ways uh, to dispose of the remnants of her old life that she was so desperate to get rid of. Paul's words here to the Galatians ring true from my own experience. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. If we want to be the kind of community of grace that really can make a difference in the world, then we need to be sure to be a community that restores people gently. And we read on in Galatians 6 here, Paul writes, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Now, at first glance, this little uh, selection of verses seems to be a bit of a contradiction. He starts out saying, carry each other's burdens, and he finishes with, each one should carry their own load. Well, which is it, Paul? Well, it's, it's both, actually, and there are different words uh, used in the original text here. The word at the end for own load is a word that was used to describe a, a soldier's uh, backpack that would have all of the gear that he would need um, to, to take care of himself on his own. It's the stuff that everybody has to deal with uh, on a regular basis. We all have bills to pay. We all have chores to do. We have difficulties of life that we need to be prepared to take care of ourselves. But the word Paul uses for burdens in the first part of this passage uh, is a phrase that means a heavy and overwhelming weight. And that's what the church is supposed to be here for, to help each other carry the heavy things of life. Again, I think we're doing a pretty good job of this in the orchard, but again, we need to keep this vision in front of us. That's our job together as a community of grace, to carry the heavy things together. When a family member dies... When a loved one gets terrible news from the doctor about their cancer, when a spouse leaves, when a job is lost, those are major burdens that we need to help each other with. And I'm glad to say that in this church family, we have helped people deal with every one of those items. Amen. So here's number two. Uh, oh, before I get to that. Uh, the idea that Paul warns against people in the church thinking in this passage as he says uh, that, they are, that they think they are something when they are not. And this warning cuts uh, two ways. We can see ourselves as too self-important to help others in their need, uh, but we could also see ourselves as too self-important to accept help from anyone else. Those are both errors that we can make on this issue of, of burdens. So here's number two in your notes. 
Uh, to be the kind of community of grace that can change the world, we need to make sure to be a community that carries burdens gladly. That we're honored to be able to care for one another in those ways. You know where that best happens in a church? In life groups. You've probably heard me refer to those uh, a time or two before. It happens in those small group relationships that we form in the body. And unless we're sharing the details of our life with a a small handful of Christian friends that can help us, we're going to miss out on the opportunity to receive help from our brothers and sisters, and we're going to cheat the rest of our church family out of the opportunity of offering their help to us and being blessed in that process. So we're going to be really emphasizing our life groups even more than we ever have before um, starting this fall for this very reason, that we need to carry one another's burdens, and we can't do that in a room this size. Nobody knows what's going on in everyone's life. And this is one of those areas that I'm having to learn and grow in personally um, as a pastor, because I love every one of you, and I want to do everything I possibly can to help each and every person who comes through our church family. But it is already way beyond my ability to keep up. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but we have had way over a thousand different people attend worship services with us here in the orchard. And at this point in our church life, we have at least 250 who would consider this their church home. And so the, the orchard has way more people than I can effectively care for already. And if uh, I didn't think that it was too much for me to handle, then I might actually be uh, tripping over Paul's words here where he says he thinks he's something he's not. Uh, But I'm glad Paul doesn't dump the load of, of carrying the heavy burdens of church community on pastors anyway. He doesn't say pastors carry everyone's burdens. He says carry each other's burdens. And to be the kind of community of grace that can really change the world, we need to make sure that we're a community that carries one another's burdens gladly. Let's read on, uh, starting in verse 6. He says, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Paul doesn't come right out and say it here, uh, but he's talking about supporting the church, what we do with our finances. If this community of faith that's, that God is growing is to continue to give instruction from God's word to an ever-growing crowd of people coming to, to be a part of it, it's going to take an increasing uh, commitment to giving in that direction. And Paul goes on to say about what we do with the resources that God has blessed us with. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. If our our primary concern about what we're to do with our money is to spend it on temporary pleasures and the things of this world, Paul says all that stuff is going to decay and become worthless eventually anyway. On the other hand, whatever is invested in step with the spirit is going to reap eternal dividends. And both in the lives that it touches as a result of the gift, uh, but also in the life of those who give as they become more like Christ in the process. So number three in your notes is, uh, in order to be the kind of community of grace that can change the world, we need to make sure to be a community that shares blessings generously. And again, I have no complaints uh, in this area as far as our church family goes. We're doing a pretty good job of this so far. Uh, In fact, I can't tell you how many church planters that I talk with uh, all the time uh, where financial support of the ministries that they are leading um, is holding them back greatly from doing effective ministry where God has called them. And here in the orchard, we don't have that problem. We are meeting all of our expenses, and that is awesome. Uh, But there are hundreds and hundreds of people yet to be reached in this valley. And what has gotten us to this point in our church life is not going to take us where we need to go and where the Spirit wants us to stay in step with him to next. We need to continue to be a community that shares blessings generously. Verses 9 and 10 here in, in Galatians 6 say, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest If we do not give up, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. 
Here's a truth that we may not consider very often. Even if our church had 10 times the financial income that we currently do, uh, that alone would not be enough to purchase the benefits of a community of grace that God wants for us. It still takes every one of us using our gifts, using the way that God has equipped us to serve and minister to the people around us. We need to keep this vision in front of us all the time that uh, a transformative community of grace is one where none of us becomes weary or gives up, but where we do good to all people starting within the community of faith, within our church family. I have to confess that up to a couple weeks ago, I was uh, beginning to feel a distinct sense of weariness uh, with the good work that God has called me to here in the orchard. And just when I needed it most, God provided me with the opportunity to uh, attend a conference a couple of weeks ago uh, where God's vision for this community of grace was uh, again reignited, rekindled inside of me. And I want, I want that same experience for as many people in our church family as possible. And so one of the things that's going to be happening in this coming year is that I'm going to be inviting many of you uh, individually uh, to come with me uh, and get some training about this vision of a community of grace that God wants to develop here in the orchard uh, for Emmett and beyond. So be, be expecting my phone call. Don't dodge me. Okay. <laughs> that brings us to number five in your notes outline, or sorry, number four. Uh, We need to be a community that serves others faithfully. Paul goes on in verse 11. He says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation, God's spirit inside of his family. God is really into this new creation thing that he wants to do in and through each one of us. In fact, at the very end of the Bible, in Revelation 21, 5, John is giving a a vision, a recording, a vision of heaven that he was given, and he records this about what he saw. He says, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God is all about new creation in our hearts, in our church family, and in the hearts of the people in the community where he has placed us. God is in the business of making everything new, and it doesn't happen by following rules and laws. It happens by placing our faith in Jesus and accepting his free gift of grace. And others who are around us get to experience the benefits as we live together as a community of grace in their presence. One time there was a skeptic who had a friend that had recently become a Christian, uh, even though he had recently been a serious alcoholic. And the skeptic asked his friend, do you really believe the miracles in the Bible? And his friend answered, of course I do. And the skeptic laughed and asked, you mean that you really believe that Jesus could turn water into wine? And his friend answered, I sure do. In my home, he's turned wine into food and clothing and furniture. (laughs) God's all about new creation for every one of us. In his book, Kingdoms in Conflict, Chuck Colson shared about a period of time in the early 1980s when Poland was firmly behind the Iron Curtain as a part of the Soviet communist bloc. And the government of their prime minister, um, Jaruzelski, had ordered crosses removed from classroom walls, just as they had been in factories and hospitals and other public institutions. And Catholic bishops attacked the ban, and it stirred up great anger and resentment uh, all across Poland. And ultimately, the government relented, um, although insisting that the law remain on the books, uh, but agreeing not to press for the removal of of crosses, especially in schoolrooms. But one zealous communist school administrator in the city of Garlin Uh, decided that the law was the law. So one evening, he had seven large crosses removed from the school's lecture halls, where they had hung since the school's founding in the 1920s. Days later, a group of parents entered the school and hung more crosses. The administrator promptly had these taken down as well. The next day, two-thirds of the school's 600 students staged a sit-in. 
And when heavily armed riot police arrived, the students were forced out into the street. Then they marched, crosses held high to a nearby church where they were joined by 2,500 other students from nearby schools for a morning of prayer and support of the protest. Soldiers surrounded the church, but the pictures from inside of the students holding crosses high above their heads flashed around the world. And so did the words of the priest who delivered the message to the weeping congregation that morning when he said, there is no Poland without a cross. A good case could be made uh, that the same assertion is true about the United States. There is no United States without the cross. Amen. And it should go without saying that there is no church without the cross. That's the hinge point of all of human history, the one place where payment was made for the cost of every person's sin. That place is the cross of Jesus Christ. On the cross, the, the blood of Christ became the source of our salvation. It's the, it's the cross of Christ alone that offers real transformation of hearts and lives. And once we understand the gospel, we boast exclusively, as Paul did, in the cross of Jesus. It's where our sense of identity and self-image come from. Religion leads us to boast in something that we have done. The gospel leads us to boast in the cross alone. So number five in your notes, uh, if you want to write this down, in order to live as a transformed community of grace that has the ability to change the world around us, we need to be a community that worships Jesus boldly. The band is going to come back up and, and lead us in a song as we uh, prepare to worship Jesus in the way that he asked us to by remembering his sacrifice for us on the cross that purchases forgiveness for us. It's the offer of God's free grace that we don't have to earn. And as the band's getting ready, I want to read the last few verses of Paul's letter here to the Galatians, starting in verse 16. He says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit brothers and sisters. Amen. Peace and mercy and grace are available to every one of us today because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Amen. He not only offers forgiveness for all of our sins, but he invites us into his family, which is a community of grace, keeping in step with the Spirit, is his plan for the transformation of the world. And whenever you see the chaos on the news, remember that we are the community of grace that God has planted to affect change in the world. We get to be a part of it. Isn't that an amazing idea that God would invite us to be his partners, to be his ambassadors? Uh, as the band leads this next song, um, the ushers are going to pass uh, trays of the communion elements down your row. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've committed your life to him, we invite you to participate with us. Just take one of those stacks of cups and hold on to it as the tray comes by. And after the song is over, I'll come back up and lead us as we worship Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace that is freely given to those of us who put our faith and our trust in your son, Jesus. God, we thank you that uh, although our, our salvation is secured uh, by your grace through our faith, that it doesn't stop there, that you, by your spirit, work in our hearts to transform us. And God, that you invite us to keep in step with you and in doing so, keep us in step with each other so that we can be an instrument of your transformation in the world. God, that's, uh, that's hard for us to get our minds around. God, remind us that we're, we're, not, we're not to do this on our own, that we don't have to, to do things to please you out of our own strength. But God, we just have to listen to you. We have to follow the leading of your spirit. God, help us to be a, a congregation, a people that, that do that faithfully together. That we restore others gently. That we, that we share burdens gladly. That we, that we give of our blessings generously. That we serve faithfully and that we worship you boldly regardless of what happens around us. God, we thank you for your promise to never leave us or forsake us. And the way that you sealed that promise 
um, by sending your own son to shed his blood on our behalf. God, draw us to the cross of Christ for all of our sufficiency and for what you want to do in and through our lives. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.